we want to do further down. Okay, we're, uh, we're in order here for the January meeting of the Water University Transportation Authority. I don't think we need to go to the stuck hole roll. Here. Here. Director Alba. Here. Director Del Bono. Here. Welcome, Director Hughes. Yeah. Here. All right. We've got a full house. Will you uh, please stand if you're here or stand if you're there and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, welcome to WIDA's uh, Board of Directors meeting. Uh, this monthly meeting is being conducted in person and by video conference that is being recorded. To reduce background noise, all video conference participants will be joining the meeting in listen only mode and will be muted during the discussion. WIDA welcomes comments from the public. A public comment period will be set aside after each discussion period and will be accepted in person and by video conference. Video conference participants wishing to speak are requested to please email your name and item number you'd like to comment on to board of directors at watertransit.org. It's board of directors at watertransit.org. If you're unable to send an email, you will be given an opportunity to uh, speak on the item uh, after those who've uh, signed up. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get into item number three on the agenda, which starts with uh, the report of the board chair, uh, who is me. So uh, welcome to 2023. We look forward to a really exciting uh, year here in, in Pina and in Water Transit. And there's a number of items we'll cover on the agenda today that, that will really set the stage for thinking and policy for the organization going forward. So we look forward to a... Uh, you know, a really solid, uh, com you know, a good discussion today on a number of uh, important uh, issues. Uh, I, I think I want to give credit to the agency and the workers of the agency for their, uh, their, their leadership and their productivity during this unfortunately diff difficult time of uh, you know, weather that we're not used to seeing in California. So uh, it seems like the weather patterns have Change significantly, and we're just seeing hotter mm -hmm. hots and colder colds and drier dries and wetter wets, and that's just what we're going through right now. So this will be a near record uh, storm by the time it's done, and it had uh, obviously impacts on operations and service. But I think you know, we came through it pretty uh, pretty solidly so far. You know, took the took the steps to close down what we needed to close down without. Uh, closing down the stuff we didn't need to close. And so kept things going and keep kept people relying uh, on on Rita uh, for their to be able to get where they need to go. But that's our main function. And you know, to the effect that we can keep things operating and do so safely, that's our that's our that's our charge. So uh, you know, thank you for that. Uh want to thank uh my fellow board members, and in a moment, we'll have a new fellow board member. I don't know if we do or we will. What's going to happen here? Uh, but for your diligence uh, uh, over the years, last year, this has been a tough time, and we're working through a lot of things. So I really appreciate the leadership. I mean, this is a really fine group, and uh, really in enjoy working with you. Uh, Seamus, I know you had a difficult couple of days here. Uh, with your dad missing for a while, and I'm sure that didn't feel very, very safe or very, very good. But thank goodness he's found, and and you know we were all praying for you. So and him, so know that you went through a difficult time. Um, last uh, last month we met in Vallejo, which was really great. It was a really nice experience to be there. We had a great crowd. We had a good agenda. We received a really fine presentation from some uh, students who uh, you did, did a great job. And it was uh, it was Tony and Tintley's last meeting as a member of the board of uh, Water Transportation Emergency Transportation Authority and the Water Transportation Authority that preceded it. Tony was a member from the beginning. So he's the person who uh, has sort of took it the whole distance. 
and last month was his uh, last month, so we had a chance to honor and thank uh, Tony for his service. Uh, but uh, as George Harrison once said, all, th all things must pass, and uh, Tony's still with us, and he's here today, so good to see you, Tony, on the screen again, and I look you. forward to continued work uh, with you. You, you. you never really get to leave. But it is exciting that we have a new board member who was named uh, to, to our agency by Governor Newsom. And she's a uh, Pip and Do, and she replaces Tony on the board and uh, is, you know, ha has quite a, uh, a, you know, quite an impressive record. And when you hear some of the things that she does, you can kind of see the nature of the person and why she was appointed because her dedication to community and public service are really, really unmatched. And she, you know, she served on the Vallejo City Council from 2014 to 2022. So she's used to meetings like this and uh, sort of the rules of order of this kind of work. So we know we won't have any problems with that because you run them and been part of that and so forth. But uh, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, Pip and Do's background and then we're going to get you, uh, we're going to get you sworn in as a member. So she's a realtor serving the North East Bay areas uh, for the last 16 years. She's currently the pre president of Vallejo Main Street, president elect of the Solano Association of Realtors, serves on the executive board for the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce as their government affairs committee chair. She served as council member of the uh, city of Vallejo, as I said, uh, for nine years. She's the, pre the past president of the North Bay Division for the League of California Cities and served the, uh, served the league as chair of the transportation communications and the Public Works Policy Committee, Chair of the Public Safety Task Force, the Governance Task Force, the Chair of the Public Safety Policy Committee, and as a member of the Governance Committee and as a member of the Board of Directors. Wow. And uh, probably most importantly, she is, uh, she is the mom of three girls. So uh, welcome to the fold. We've been excited to uh, bring you aboard for, I think, a long time. And now I think it's time to swear you in, although I think I may have, yeah, there we go. We put it over there. So I didn't, I never got to do this before. I mean, somehow other board members came, but they sort of swore themselves in. I'm not sure how they do it. We should probably check to see if this whole thing is uh, legit. But uh, this is the oath of, oath of office for a board member, San Francisco Water Emergency Transportation Authority under state constitution, article uh, 20, section three. So why don't we stand up? Uh, Pippin and repeat after me. I Pippin do. I Pippin do. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. <laughs> against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance of the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Uh, welcome to the board. It's great to have you. <laughs> We've got a little piece of paper here to sign, and, and or you probably have signed it already. One that looks a lot like it. But thank you very much. It took months for mine to make it into the file. I remember that. So, uh, welcome, Pippin. And I think, in honor of your uh, emergence as a board member, you know, the next part of the uh, agenda item four is reports of directors. So, having uh, now accepted the oath, maybe we'll give you a chance to say why you. Uh, why you accepted, volunteered, and accepted the position. Yeah, so I am very excited to be here today. Um, the ferry is uh, a very important asset to the city of Vallejo. Um, and I have long watched um, Mayor Intentionally um, serve this organization. And um, I actually got to meet um, him, gosh, like 12 years ago through Leadership Vallejo and um, just hearing his passion for the community and, um, and his love for this organization um, really inspired me and um, serving in a variety of roles that were transportation related really um, shifted my focus and, and, and expanded my education on all things transportation. And so when uh, this opportunity 
came up. I was excited and I thank you, uh, Tony, for your patience as it took so long for me to be able to take this position and you hung in there uh, for the duration. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, uh, thanks, Pippin. We uh, really welcome you and we're excited to work together and uh, we'll, uh, we, there's a lot in front of us. So thank you. Let me turn it over to the Vice Chair, Monique Moyer. Well, thank you very much for being willing to serve and for all the service that you give the community. Um, so welcome ben, to, to our uh, uh, austere board um, and more importantly to a great agency. So really delighted to have your representation and following on the heels of our wonderful um, uh, board member and Mr. Intutoli. So that's a, a great way to start the new year. Looking forward to the contributions. And I uh, just want to add my, my thanks and gratitude, as always, to the wonderful members of our, uh, our agency who have um, obviously been uh, just incredible through the last, where are we, two, three weeks? I'm, I've lost track now. Um, and a week ago, I think I heard. So thank you as always for all that you contribute to to ensuring that, um, that you know all of our customers and our teammates are safe, um, but also can get where they need to go uh, in the best circumstances possible. So always, uh, as always, very grateful for that. No, thank you. Thanks, Director Moore. I'll go to our our longest serving member now, I think, uh, <laughs> with Tony having moved along, you're the senior member. Yeah, right. great. <laughs> Congratulations. And looking forward to serving with you. And again, I'll reiterate what everybody else has said. Said thanks to the staff for everything. Um, I was like, there were some issues going on, but I'll hear about that later. But hopefully everything's working out good. And I uh, appreciate all the work that's been done the last three weeks. I know we're sitting in Alameda. I've been dealing with the, the same storm issue, but I'm I do have to say as a fourth generation Californian, thank God our reservoirs are going to be full because that's that is the positive out of this. And I think all of us that have lived here over the last several years or decades know what drought brings and hopefully this will bring that some relief too. So I know we just gonna suffer a little bit for it, but in the long run, California is gonna prevail. So that's good. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Well, and well said, thank you. And uh, Director Jessica Allen. Yeah, um, without repeating too much, welcome, Pippin. Fantastic to have you here. Look forward to serving with you. And again, thank you to uh, Tony for being part of the organization for so long uh, and for providing absolutely fantastic leadership during the last couple of decades. Um, and um, that's about it. Um, rain in the horizon continued. Flooding, we'll see uh, storms, but we'll we'll push through it and get out on the other side. Uh, thanks, Director. I appreciate it. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Director uh, Murphy and his team for some uh, presentations on all the uh, important goings on at our agency. Thank you, Chair Wonderman. Thanks, members of the board. Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome, Director Dew. Uh, we wanted to cover a few uh, timely items here. Uh, the first one has to do with weather. Um, you can imagine that weather has an impact on just about everything uh, that happens around the region. Uh, transit is no exception. And just because of the nature of our operations, we're a little bit more susceptible to some of the wind and weather and swell impacts that we've seen. So we've been dealing with that. Uh, Tim Hanners, uh, our manager of operations and engineering, has been uh, working with our contract operator, Blue and Gold, on how to adjust service and make sure that we can put something reliable out there. And if we can't, make sure that we're making changes and communicating with folks. Uh, so I wanted to turn it over to Tim just to talk a little bit about some of the nuances of our service and how it's impacted uh, by the weather that we've been receiving lately. Go ahead, Tim. Good afternoon, Chair Wonderman and members of the board. Welcome, Director Dew. I look forward to working with you. Um, as we all know, we've had some severe events recently, weather events in, in California, and it has affected uh, some of our operations. Um, specifically, um, South San Francisco and Harbor Bay. We're not uh, hearing you. We lost We lost it. Lose audio. We, we see you. We had you at the beginning. Test. Can you hear me now? Test, test. You did. 
test. Can you guys hear me now? Wave if you can hear us. <laughs> yeah, good. Try speaking again and see if it works. Test. Can you can you guys hear me? Good. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Much better. Did did you get any of that, or was I muted the entire time? No, 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 no. But we agree with everything you said. So. <laughs> okay, so I started off well. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, specifically in our service, uh, South San Francisco, the South San Francisco ferry terminal at Oyster Point and Harbor Bay, uh, particularly when the winds kick up above twenty knots. Um, have a lot of exposure and it's really hard for our vessels to get in and out of both of those terminals. So those are the, the two terminals that are directly affected specifically when there's a southerly blowing in. Um, what we've been doing to mitigate this weather is we, we've been meeting every day um, with blue and gold operations, reaching out to the crews, talking about what they're seeing out there and trying to predict on a day-to-day -day basis what the weather looks like. Fortunately, with, with all the events that have occurred and everything we've seen on the news, we've really had minimal cancellations. Um, and those cancellations have been um, done at both Harbor Bay and South San Francisco. Um, what we decided to do uh, for those services is when we could predict that the winds were gonna be over 20 knots and it was gonna be really rough out there, we went ahead and tried to give passengers at least a 24 hour notice. Um, what's hard specifically about South San Francisco is there's not many options for passengers to return home once we drop them off in the morning. And so even if the weather looks okay and we feel like we can make the service in the morning, we don't wanna strand our passengers in South San Francisco and not give them any options to get home. Harbor Bay, um, our customers have a couple more options. They can, they can head over to Seaplane uh, they could go over to Main Street. Um, we did have a few cancellations at night when the weather was really rough at downtown San Francisco. Um, you know, the staff, we, we worked together, communicated, Thomas Hall was involved. We even reached out to Golden Gate um, and we all felt that at that time um, that we needed to cancel those last couple runs. Um, but overall, I think, you know, the crew's done a great job. Um, I, don't, I don't believe we've had any injuries related to the weather. And so we're keeping the crew safe you know, keeping the passengers safe and blue and gold uh, is doing a great job communicating with us and to the crew members in the field. Thank you, Tim. I think one of the one of the key points there is just communicating to our customers when we know that there will be impacts. And uh, that's something that our communications manager, uh, Tom Hall, uh, has reiterated over and over. We, we If there's a, a good chance that a lot of runs are going to be canceled and uh, we don't want to surprise people with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we, we did on one day cancel those two uh, routes uh, completely because we knew that the service would be unreliable. Uh, fortunately, haven't had to do that beyond that. It's not just us. Uh, Golden Gate Ferry has had uh, the same issues with, uh, with much of their service and have had to cancel uh, runs when the swells have been most extreme so uh so we are going to continue to just monitor and manage that uh, and thanks to tim and his team and the team of blue and gold for helping us with that um, did, did golden gate do you know did they cancel runs uh to san francisco or did they cancel the, the tiburon and angel island now? they they canceled they, angel island oh go ahead tim you, you, you know they that. canceled angel angel island well the state park shut it down so in essence, yeah, they, they canceled that. And they ended up canceling the two last runs at downtown San Francisco the same uh, night that, that we did. Uh, it was just really, really rough. And they called in uh, bus service for those two last runs. Thank you. Um, one piece of good news we wanted to bring to your attention, we did uh, receive in the omnibus package that was approved by Congress uh, an earmark that uh, Congressman Gary Mindy helped us secure. Uh, thanks to him and his office for working on this. It's an important one. Uh, you know our challenges with the CARB uh, regulations are centered around our ability to accommodate diesel particulate filters on our vessels. And the first two Dorado vessels that uh, one of which has been delivered, the other one uh, will be delivered this year, uh, weren't engineered and designed to accommodate DPFs because of the the, the overlapping uh, uh, time frames for the uh, design and the regulations becoming effective. We were able to, at the last minute, redesign vessels three and four uh, to have enough room to accommodate DPFs, but we knew there'd be a cost associated with that. One and a half million dollars is significant. 
So we sought uh, this earmark uh, from uh, Congressman Garamendi. He was able to successfully include it uh, in the omnibus bill and be working with FTA to secure uh, these funds uh, and deliver them to our uh, shipyard uh, and have the DPFs added uh, to vessels three and four so that they will be fully hard compliant. Uh, and then the rest of our CARB compliance plan, our ACE plan, which is an alternative compliance plan, the board has heard details uh, on that already. Uh, and we've had recent discussions with CARB that have been really productive about how they plan to calculate greenhouse gas emissions when they review plans like the one that we'll be submitting. And they're right in line with our expectations of how they would be calculating. So uh, we, we think it's uh, clear for us to go ahead and submit that plan. Uh, the regulations are effective uh, and moving forward as long as we're able to continue to take advantage of the grants and funding that is available to be able to be compliant uh, as those regulations get phased in. Uh, state operating assistance continues to be a challenge. Uh, the governor's budget was released. It was released after the agenda was prepared. So I want to share some of the details that were included there. Uh, not they most notably did not include any state operating assistance assistance and it's not because the governor's office doesn't realize that that's an issue uh, that needs to be addressed but they've made it clear that they want to hear uh, from the legislature that this is a problem that needs to be solved and some uh, proposed solutions for how uh, it should be addressed given the almost five billion dollar deficit that the budget has this year uh, anything that affects the general fund is going to be a real challenge so uh, it's going to be uh, a difficult issue to tackle. Uh, we're going to need to have a really robust advocacy presence uh, and effort to be able to uh, resolve this. Uh, but folks know how important it is uh, and are working hard on it. Beyond the operating assistance, the governor's budget also cut in half the supplemental TIRCP funding uh, that came from last year's uh, surplus that was identified uh, to be included in this upcoming budget. In in the last budget, so it went from two billion uh, to one billion, and that's a that's going to have a big impact on capital projects. The region MTC has already uh, earmarked those funds uh, for different projects around the region. Um, cutting that in half is going to have impacts on project delivery. It also reduced the governor's budget. Also reduced zero emission vehicle funding from ten billion to eight point nine billion. Most of those cuts have to do with. Uh, automobile related uh, zero emission transition and the uh, cuts to the transit programs have been less impactful. So that's good news. But uh, we all recognize that the governor's budget very rarely gets rubber stamped by the legislature. It usually goes through significant changes. Uh, Senator Weiner, in particular, has taken issue with the cuts to the transit capital programs and the lack of any inclusion of operating assistance. Uh, so Voices are already starting to be heard, uh, asking for those elements to be added back in. Uh, the normal sales tax related programs and carbon based uh, uh, related programs uh, that are funded through those elements uh, have been reduced just slightly. And that's understandable given the reduced sales tax that the state is experiencing and the lower than expected returns uh, for the greenhouse gas uh, emissions system, uh, emission funding programs. Um, the CTA uh, is, has uh, put out a survey of all transit agencies to try and understand who is facing fiscal cliffs, who has the most immediate needs moving forward. Uh, WIDA is one of those agencies that has uh, an immediate need. Uh, beyond FY24, uh, we know uh, that our federal funding will run out. Uh, we're not alone. There are other agencies that are facing that fiscal cliff around that same time frame. They're all the most fair dependent agencies around the state. And those agencies happen to be mostly located in the Bay Area. We've done a great job getting high fare box returns uh, in, our, in our transit systems in the Bay Area. But one of the penalties now that we're realizing is uh, without customers having fully returned, we were the most vulnerable uh, to uh, the economic issues, financial issues that we're experiencing. So uh, that survey will tell us who is at the top of the list uh, in terms of fiscal cliff, but also what other needs, other systems that don't necessarily have a fiscal cliff that they're facing, what other challenges they're having. And workforce seems to be emerging as one of the primary issues that bus agencies that uh, aren't as stressed financially uh, are having. They just can't find 
uh, enough drivers for those buses, enough operators for those rail systems. And so if there's going to be that, that's a, those challenges are affecting service, their ability to bring it back and their ability to maintain it the same way that our fiscal cliff issues. Are. So if there is funding that emerges from the state, it's likely that it could address some of those issues and we'll have an understanding of how to quantify those issues after the California Transit Association survey is completed. Um, now I want to turn it over to Kevin and Tom Hall, Kevin Connolly and Tom Hall. Uh, we thought it would be good timing to uh, provide a summary of how ridership evolved over the calendar year in, a, in 2022 uh, and um, talk a little bit about how the weather's impacting uh, our ridership at the end of the year and also how it just normally has that impact. Uh, because we are a, 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 a system that has seasonal adjustments in terms of ridership. So Kevin and I are going to tag team this review of, of ridership. It seems like a good opportunity to take a whole step of ridership in, in the past 12 months. So this is the graph in uh, yeah. So uh, this is just sort of a holistic look at the last uh, three full years going back to January 2019 on the left side, all the way to December 2022, right hand side. Bonus points to figure out where the pandemic happened, <laughs> where the pandemic recovery program. You can see on the huge uh, literally decimating our ridership. And then a real jump back in July of This is a comparison in blue. You see the average daily ridership for 2021 and the maintenance for 2022. Uh, the left side of this chart is a bit apples and oranges from uh, January to June of 2021. That was prior to the pandemic recovery program. So we were operating a rather austere service on just three routes. In July, uh, we went to six routes and uh, uh, a lot of service. And so you see the numbers still over that second count, at least 1,500 more passengers per day every month, going above 2,000 passengers. So that's a good sign of how much better ridership was in 2022 over 2021. More people came back. We continue to, to make people aware of services and more than welcome to them. So it's a very much bigger. This is flashing the water, which is green to 2022 again. 2019 is the last year. So this is a comparison. Um, I would say that I should five months between 2022. Uh, we're still far short of what we were in our year. Keep in mind that 2019 was our best ridership year of all time. Um, so we are measuring ourselves in a really high bar, but that, that's the reality. We're still at several thousand, not uh, several thousand, a few thousand uh, passengers per day. Take it over to Kevin to talk about that kind of data. Thank you, Tom. So um, here's two graphic representations of the pandemic recovery program. The board members, as well as the audience at home in July of 2021, we restarted our service. We didn't just restart from what it used to be. We changed the nature and the tenor of the service. And the graphic on the left sort of describes it very well in terms of profits, company, great jobs. Uh, the blue line is the number of trips. Uh, and the green line in, back in 2019 and the green line is what we did starting in 2021. And overall, it was more trips. Um, and then we overall, you can see the distinct difference between in the mid but we did a lot more trips in the mid and that was purposeful. And we did this despite the fact that we opened a new terminal in that year, and we actually reduced the number of vessels in service from 12 to 11. So we, we took a step backwards in terms of the boats, but we managed to have a lot more service. Well, uh, but we changed sort of the, the profile of it. And on the right is sort of the, the results of that. And as you can see from the blue line, which is pre pandemic, our previous service was notably key, you know, you know, truthfully, between 2016 and 2019, we really struggled to have enough vessels on hand to meet those peaks 
but the result was in the mid day of the week, it's always still getting riding. And as you can see, like we have seen better ridership in the midday and the late evenings as well. And oh, but we see less of difference between our peak period time and our midday. And had we not done what we did in the midday, we would be pretty confident that we would have really good. So that's sort of the history in terms of the service. Um, this is expanded across the year. Again, just another note that you know, our midday and our evening services back to where and even better than what we had the pre pandemic, while our peak oriented service for our historic and strong um, is there's still some peak, but it's not really what it was. And that leads us to sort of these conclusions, and here we'll give the kind of presentation a little bit. Um, there's both internal and external factors, things that we can't control. We, can't. Uh, we recently did a passenger survey. The passenger survey showed 40% of our passengers are new to the system. That's a tremendous success. What we did in terms of the service worked from that perspective. The inverse of that is that we actually lost probably 50 or 60% of our normal riders. They never came. Um, but our off, like I mentioned, the off peak and the weekend has returned to near pandemic or better in the pandemic levels. That is recreational discretionary trips. They're often subject to seasonality. It's the last two years we've seen more recreational experience. But in, in the good season, we're seeing really strong membership in, in stresses of the system. Uh, but on the other side, the peak period trends demand is flat. It's been flat and declining since August. And those are factors outside of our control by and large. And we certainly have enough service in the peak period. We haven't really reduced the service. But there's a continuum of the remote work program. And this is notable. San Francisco stands out in the country. It's not just stable 40 percent. We're 40 percent where other cities are 50 and 60 percent. And then we have some, we have in the tech sector, which is strong for our peak, right? It's just really in our relationship. So, you know, the question for us in asking as we start to look at designing our service over the next year or two is that this cliff is, is this the new normal? And how do we do that? I was just going to ask Kevin, you know, maybe it's too early, but, uh, you know, it seems like there's a steady return to work. You know, companies are, I haven't heard too many who said, well, you know, we're working hybrid, but let's not do that. Let's just go fully virtual. Did it in the beginning, you know, but as, as there was a return, and then some folks are saying, well, you know, we need to go from two days to three. Or when you go from zero to two, but but generally in that direction. So we saw that. I think the effect of that. But now now it's plateaued. It's plateaued over a couple of months. And so I'm wondering, you know, if there's something we're missing here in terms of our own service, or is there something, you know, is is in fact the daily population in the in the work areas a little bit greater, but we're not picking it up. Yes, that's the question. Or is it not greater? Is it just, you know, people aren't coming no matter what people are telling them to do? <laughs> it's, yeah. a great, it's a great question. I, I, would answer, I would love to do it, you know, uh, but I would, I think the more nuanced, we don't, we don't have it here, but we're going to dive deep into it. It's, are we seeing more normality on the Tuesdays and Thursdays? You know, and at what point do we cross a, a line where, we change our service, not traditionally all train of service to Monday to Friday. We have a different type of service, the free, the free reference. It's kind of educated. Tom's got a lot of great charts. Thank you. So we're looking at uh, here, we're looking at basically we pick our weekday service. Really road ridership overall region compared to weekend ridership. But what's that look like before the pandemic now? So on the left, you see 2019, but we pay total work for the entire year, premiums on weekend ridership. You see the weekend ridership is a pretty small slice of the overall ridership profile for us. That's gained in importance because ridership on weekends has bounced back really strong, and ridership on weekdays has not. 
So it's a, it's a much more important piece of the overall ridership puzzle for us now. And uh, honestly, our our are have been there so far. This is a uh, chart showing that in a little different format, ridership by day of the week, 2019 to 2023. Uh, you can see the far below. Uh, Friday, and then Saturday, and Sunday, and Saturday. Good sign that it shows us about the investment of the program that shows us the. the, program, um, shows the yeah. In terms of seasonality, this is really a consideration to make when we think about how our service is structured. It's kind of the same, you know, what it looks like in the future in terms of the priority place on for resources, safe service, weekend service. I think this could potentially you know, turn into a you know, to, to peak service versus off peak service on weekdays during certain seasons as well. We're so looking at um, how ridership changes based on the season. So what we're defining peak season, keep it nice and clean, is six months, um, May or October, and off season being. Um, just to keep it nice and easy, we got six months each. Even though it's a little bit more nuanced in reality. Um, in 2019, weekdays, there wasn't really much of a fall off on, on weekdays from the peak season to off season. That speaks to a lot of commuters who have to go to work in the lives just like they have to go to work in the uh, And then uh, in 2022, you know, it's a little more, as a percentage, it's a little more dramatic, um, which speaks to that off peak midday ridership that we're seeing in agreements there. Um, but overall, it's not a huge drop off. We're not seeing the higher and higher. Okay, really run super dramatically. I'll also mention, you know, 2022, this is a little bit of small sample size to here because we, there were a number of uh, impacts in 2022, including the way in January, basically about four months, we did actually be really funny. And so that's one of the things. And then you look at seasonality on weekends, a much different story. Um, Seasonality on weekends pre pandemic was a huge factor. Part of this is that before the pandemic, we did operate less service during the winter. Um, not that full six month period, but uh, about four months, we had poor service on uh, the year on the service. Um, so that is a factor. We have a robust year round weekend service on those two routes, which we're right now. Um, but there was a huge, huge downshift in the number of people who were riding during the offseason, as you would expect. Um, if you're not coming to the city on any March in uh, weather like this as you are in the summer, um, that, 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 that change has, has lessened. And, and, and part of that is because we've invested in service on the weekends year round, um, so it's available. But the fact that we, that we have more off season weekend riders this year than we did in 2019, our best ridership year ever, speaks to the demand that still sits there. So, uh, we thought that was important, important to point out. And then this is uh, a version of a graph that you see every month in the, in the ship update that, that kind of brings it together. Um, but just for Saturdays and Sundays, and using our really as a stand in for the regional operator. And of course, the team of um, has had success on uh, covering some weekend ridership. This shows that that success has been magnified for us. Uh, due to those taking the ferry uh, both on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, Sundays are really uh, encouraging. We, I, I personally think part of it is that more folks are working from home on Mondays, so going out uh, on the town on Sunday is less of a burden. You don't have to wake up super early Monday to do. Uh, you're more likely to get on the ferry Sunday if you don't have to get back on. Uh, that's not the F theory. Uh, speaking to sort of event ties uh, ridership, uh, we wanted to take a look at how uh, big events, um, this fit another example is in Friday weekend, Fourth of July weekend, Labor Day weekend, but Flea weekend is obviously uh, near and dear to our heart as our biggest ridership weekend of the year. Uh, we wanted to compare, you know, how, how did it look in 2022 compared to years past, going way back before the pandemic? It was our second best year ever that we have paid on. Uh, even by 300 passengers on 2015. Uh, so we see see this as an indicator that people do want to use the ferry, they do want to use transit to get to the city. If they have a reason to use it, and there's a uh, good available service. So we searched service this year for a few weekends and we 
and uh, the writers came through and maxed out a lot of trips. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And back to Kevin and folks in the talk. So, yeah, I mean, the, the purpose of sharing this with you is we do this on a normal basis, it's a continual. But it's nice to take the year in and use this as a as a launching pad to sort of anticipating how we're going to make service changes and adaptions going into the future because, like all transit agencies, we're in fluid condition in terms of climate change. Um, and then, uh, so that that's that first question does does our profile match current market for all the search and pursuit? So what is the what is the market? And Seamus mentioned it. The, the fiscal cliff is is loom. That's a, that's maybe not next year fiscal year, but it's probably the, the following year. fiscal year after that. You're here in the SRTP that we could face as much as a thirty percent change of, of, of reduction in service that would even occur. So we're starting preparations now to potentially address something like that. Um, and then you know, so there's two sides of it. One, we we see strong markets. How do we identify those and foster them, the peak season, weekend enhancement is an option that we're, we're, we've been considering it. Potentially, we need more service potentially on weekends on one day days. We need people behind, which is a great sign. Um, there's still gaps in the peak service. Uh, it's not perfect. There's, there's areas where the Oakland service needs a five feet of, for example. Richmond needs a five, a, a four foot. So there's there we know that there's holes in the service uh, and then on the other side of it really is the you know the cost savings opportunities that will present themselves in terms of what the market is telling us. And we have um, three services: Harbor Bay, South San Francisco, and Richmond, which pre-pandemic were commute only. We only operated them during the few times. We never did midday or weekend service. Uh, we transitioned Harbor Bay and Richmond to all day in the Richmond weekend, and the results have been pretty good. Uh, our, uh, South San Francisco is still commute only, and the results have been you know, not very good in terms of their writers. And so one question is, are commute only routes really even viable? You know, should we be going to all days, both, both service both routes everywhere? But that leads to is South Sydney even that kind of uh, those are those are questions that we have to kind of ask ourselves. And then there's a there's this threshold question for WIDA, which is what's the minimum level any transit agency faces, what's the minimum level? If you go below the minimum level of sustainability, you get into what's called the death spiral, where you start to lose riders, the riders just don't come back to the system because it's just not viable anymore, and you just you start losing moves in. So we need to identify what that minimum level is. We can't go if we're looking at any cost savings. Well, unfortunately, the band comes down to the presentation. Any questions? Uh, yeah. I don't have questions. I have a statement, so should I hold that? You can make a statement. Okay. Good speak up. For um, so I, I just listened into it. I, I think, you know, besides the world changing and people not working from the office, I we can't really call this a commute service or a, you know, the traditional Monday through Friday commute service. And I, I think we've seen this over the last two years. People aren't leaving places to go to San Francisco to work and then going home. It's just not happening. And, you know, I think part of that in, in transportation and commute service, looking at this whole thing is we provide a service that we get people off the road and cars off the road and, you know, people on the water, which is a way better way of tra transporting people. So overall, I don't know if you really call this a commute service anymore. It's a ferry service that, you know, whether it be recreational, um, you know, commute or uh, there's a combination of it. I think the way you market that is like we have to look at that, um, you know, specifically look at that and how we market in it and the peak hours, because I don't. I don't see people coming back to the office Monday through Friday anytime soon. Um, you know, whether I'm old and agree that people should be at work because sometimes I feel like that, but um, it's not happening. And I mean, you're not just seeing it in the tech industry in the city. I'm seeing it in my industry, which is traditionally blue collar and people in our office don't want to come into it. They don't want to be in the office. And, you know, who can blame them? I have people that are in the firehouse that 
you know, that are on a Monday through Friday schedule that are public safety that don't think it's necessary for them to be at work all the time. I mean, it's it's really interesting to see like how this is passed on. So I'm all for diving into this um, deeper um, before we we hit that that fiscal cliff um, in looking at doing like way more research on when are people, because we don't want to lose the people that are coming in and that we want to provide a service. My mindset and my, what I'm trying to say is I want to provide a service on the water because I think it's the best to get people out of their cars, whether it's coming on the weekends, coming during the week, coming to work, going to a Giants game or whatever, and get them on a boat to bring them over here. And I know what you're talking about, consistency and having a consistent service, we're going to have to figure that out and adapt. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is by putting some money and effort and time with our team. And if we have to get more people on our team, you know, contract to help us figure that out, I think that's well worth looking at. Um, I, you know, we all know December and January is not the time we want to do that. So it's probably going to have to happen come springtime, come the summer when when people are starting to go out and go to events and coming in on the weekends. And I think just the evidence that I could back it up with being here is when we changed weekend service and we added weekend service on these routes, there was some hesitation to do it. But it's, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of scenario. They showed up and they started riding the boats. We did stuff with um, with our with our uh, fees and our 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 costs, and we we made sure we we brought them down. We even tried Dollar Day. I mean that that brought people on, and it, it showed. So I'm in favor of really like taking a hard look at this, um, especially coming up um, this springtime and summer, from my standpoint, and really diving in deep to it. I don't have any questions about it because I've watched this whole thing happen, and I still think we have the best product out there. So, and I think we should try a punk rock concert on the ferry, like the Bart did. Bart did. Right? <laughs> I'm just joking. I think this is a good thing. I think I think it's I think we have a service and a, a product to offer that that's going to say stay sustainable. We just got to make the right moves and, you know, learn from the past. Like you said, where's the bottom line where we don't want to lose the people we have that we want to add to it. So that's where I'm at with it. I don't look at it as a negative thing. I think it's just we're just going to have to readjust and take a different approach to it. So that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? That... Yeah, I just echo a lot of those comments. Um, I, you know, I, we are hearing a lot about people returning or, you know, working from home and, and all of these kinds of things, but we're seeing more congestion on our freeways. So people are definitely in their cars on the freeways going somewhere. Um, and so I don't know how we get that data to find out, you know, I, I, I remember what it looked like when it was all locked down. It's, you know, 30 minutes from Vallejo to Hayward. It was ridiculous. And now it doesn't matter what time of day you go, what day of the week you go, it's going to take you an hour um, or more. And so, you know, just trying to understand, um, you know, what's what people are, you know, I don't know how you get that data, but I would love to for us to see more of that, to understand behaviors and help influence those behaviors to get them off the road and then to, okay. We're going to take public comment in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, other members of the of the board, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, we we've not we short answer. We've done we done we did a bit of that in twenty twenty one. Right. Before we brought service back, we asked, why aren't you writing a ferry? And ninety five percent of people said because I think we should not going to work uh either retired or I think that that's probably you know, speculation. That's not I mean, like it's self selected survey. Mm -hmm. and the Just to the fact that someone was once a customer is a good chance they'll be one again. And maybe they're hesitant for some reason 
that maybe not be as viable as viable reason as they may think it is. So that's a good, good point. Go ahead with the next, uh, unless there's any questions or comments. You're going to go with the business plan update. Uh, just very briefly, uh, again for the board of heads up, we're going to be starting a round of public outreach uh, this month, moving into February, potentially March. But we've been doing some one on one meetings with uh, community based organizations, uh, going back to our business advisory groups, community advisory groups, as well as the six state county working groups that we have. So, and we're showing them the preliminary results of some of the work that we've done over the past few months, uh, namely the uh, initial evaluation results from the network expanded document. Um, so we've got a deck prepared. Uh, we're actually going to be meeting with our subcommittee uh, immediately after this meeting to embed it with them, uh, making changes that they uh, recommend and submitting that presentation uh, up to those groups in the next few months. Uh, ultimately, incorporating all of their feedback and then bringing back the comprehensive package of results uh, for the consider as a public outreach team. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, just a heads up and uh, happy to have this. Yeah, thanks for that. We we await the work product, and thanks, uh, members uh, Moyer and Alba, for your leadership on uh, working with the staff to put that together. It's really really important. Um, let's go ahead, uh, if we can, to the uh, financial. Is that ready for that, James? Do you, you have, have more the comments? Report, uh, in your packet, so we we didn't have any uh, further information to highlight from that report or any of the others that are under the executive director report, but happy to respond to any questions. Any questions from the board on the finances? Well, just just so, from one of your statements, um, Seamus, are you are you anticipating that there might be an impact in the current fiscal year? I couldn't tell from what you said earlier. No, we don't anticipate an impact in the current, okay. in the current fiscal year. We're we're on track in the current fiscal year, um, that it, that's dependent on how ridership um, uh, continues to, uh, to to be realized throughout the end of the year. The fuel prices have moderated uh, significantly, and we're close to being back to the line that we have on the budget uh, when it comes to fuel. Uh, the it is one point that that I wanted to to, to raise that. Uh, just so so we keep it in mind, we realized so many efficiencies when we implemented the pandemic recovery program. We put so much service out uh, on the water, so much more service than we had before. And you can see that reflected in the two graphs that show the peak hour and how we were able to extend it into the middle of the day and on the shoulders of the peak. And you can see in the ridership how productive that's been. We did that without any significant increases in costs. The cost increases that we've seen in the current fiscal year are really due to wages uh, from the collective bargaining agreements that were uh, completed and fuel primarily. So uh, we anticipated those, they're coming back down to earth on the fuel side. Uh, so the current fiscal year is expected to be okay. Next fiscal year, uh, we need to wait and see what it looks like and probably need Aaron, I would say a, a few more months to, before we can make a projection about that. But our current projection is that we won't need anything beyond the remainder of the federal COVID relief dollars that we have to be able to balance that budget. Anything to add, Karen? No, just um, we will over the next few months, so we'll come back before the budget. The kind of last year, we did a two year outlook before we brought the actual budget. So we're going to do that again. Um, before we, um, uh, several months are anticipated to last until the end of the crisis, but that's um, continuing on other volumes. But it's a significant nugget for federal money. Run with money, but mm -hmm. that's how those two all come together. There's no update on RM3 either. Huh? 
That's why I mean that's I'm looking for a it's the elephant yeah. in the room. Yeah. Uh, and, and here. <laughs> yeah, there is there is no no, no update okay. on that. Uh, we're still in this six month range as far as we are waiting yeah. in the aftermath of the Zali case, and we can recall was the, the companion case that the Supreme Court um, caused arm three litigation to resolve the Zali case. They resolved resolved the Zali. <laughs> and resolved it as it turns out on the ground. That turned out not necessarily. And now we're waiting to see what the Supreme Court's going to do. Um, see, Nevada are uh, strategizing how to move the Supreme Court into action. The Supreme Court controls its own docket, and um, every case before it is vitally important to the folks who are propounding those cases. And so I, I don't have any good, any news to tell you. I went to the governor's inauguration and he was sworn in by Patricia Guerrero, the chief justice. And I was seated pretty close in the middle and I, I was going to yell out. <laughs> you know, I was really tempted, you know, yeah. really quiet, <laughs> kind of similar swearing in to what Pippin just went through. I just didn't know if it was right, but I, <laughs> but I felt like it, like, come on. <laughs> Just but do the thing. We are, we, your staff and I are actively discussions with VADA's legal team, being directed by VADA's support, FTC board, um, trying to figure out what the right way to do this without, you know, there's a lot of issues. We don't want to upset apple carts that we would rather not upset. Um, and so, but, the, but we are ever mindful that it is the elephant in the room. And I'm happy to bring back a briefing, you know, an update like this one every month if you like, but, but I assure you, you'll know when there's more, more to report. Yeah, when you read in the paper what the decision was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, before there's a decision, they're going to announce a briefing schedule if they want to brief this. Um, so we're, we're, we're quite some time before a newspaper article All right. announcing the results. So just to finish up on the, on the financial, um, and sort of following up on the presentation we just had on the on the ridership. So there's so many of our normal factors are in flux. Um, at the end of 2022, the, the amount of vacancy in San Francisco office space was at 25%. So one out of every four offices, more is coming in 2023. Um, I think we really need to look hard at the workforce of the Bay Area that affects where our landings are. Um, the workforce that's growing, of course, is life sciences. Those are not in downtown San Francisco. They're in you know, knowledge, not in Vallejo, or really when they're on the Right now, they're drive to employers. Um, the, the employment sector that we've been relying on on the workforce that's been riding uh, has been tech. Tech is downsizing considerably. That also means they're gonna, they don't have the funds for their carbon neutrality goals that we've been forecasting and relying on, at least not for 2023, maybe not for 2024. So I think, I think as we look forward to, I don't know if you're planning another two year forecast, Karen, but uh, um, between that and inflation, I'm, I'm concerned. I saw. Goldman Sachs is doing a big layoff now. So it's moving past tech, the other sectors. Um, Goldman was one of the, the industries that, that required uh, return to work, which did not work. The only company I'm aware of where it's worked is Apple to some extent. I can tell you for my clients, it has not worked. Um, piggybacking on what uh, member Dabona said. So um, I, think we, I think we've got a rough two years ahead of us that we, we probably need to look at. I think that will affect our weekend ridership personally, because I think that discretionary spending is going to be severely impacted. Something to look at. I do not have a crystal ball, I just want to say, <laughs> but I am concerned. Other uh, comments, questions on the, on the finances? I, I would just say it's not on the it's not on the finances, but it affects it is that you know we we do we bear at council we do survey 
employers and employees regularly for MTC. And what we get, and we get it more than ever, is that people aren't coming to uh, using transit because of public safety fears. And it's the numbers actually have risen uh, and they were big to start with. But they, that's, the, that's the area that they name as being the main reason that they don't use it. And you know we know it's it's mostly applicable to BART. In fact, when you ask people to think about public transportation, you know a BART train hops into their head. You know we we don't have this issue. You know, we're the alternative to that set of problems. And I I wonder if we you know could point it out more that this is you know the, the you know taking the ferry alleviates your concern that's keeping you away. This is like Monique is saying, it's it's an individual choice now. It's not a company's choice. You know, maybe that'll change. You know, probably not that much, probably not that soon. So, but people are making choices. You know, some people come, some people don't. Little by little, more people come, but it's really little by little and getting little by little. So, you know, maybe there's something we could do to stimulate that because that that is the reason that's keeping a lot of people away. Maybe we're maxed up, or maybe we're maxed out. You know, the number of people who really are willing to work in person and could use the ferry are doing it. But I just have a feeling not. You know, my my instinct is that if people experience the system, you know, the reliability, the safety, the kind of fun and friendliness of it, that they they would, you know, they might take a different attacked. So maybe we could think about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Are we going to do a federal and state legislative update or are we waiting for the uh, agenda item on those issues? We covered the highlights from the updates that okay. our, our advocates have provided. We will uh, cover the legislative program with the first ranking of our agenda. So why don't we hold off because I think it's all Kind of inclusive because we're going to discuss in detail those programs and we took the ridership report so unless there's any questions uh, from the uh, from the audience on anything from our guests i don't see any hands raised on the screen hopefully people on the screen can hear us um let's go to item number six which is the consent calendar um and uh, item A, we adopt a resolution regarding remote meetings pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. And the second item B is the board meeting minutes uh, from last month. Are there any uh, items on the, uh, is there anything on the consent calendar, either one of those that anyone would like to see removed? Make a motion to approve the consent. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Uh, Paul, roll, please. Vice Chair Wunderman. Uh, yes. Vice Chair Moyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Del Bono. Yes. Director Duke. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's go to item number seven approve WEED as a 2023 legislative program. Good afternoon, Chair. I'm Karen Scando and Government and Regulatory Affairs Specialist. Uh, last month, I provided a brief of the YouTube Draft 2023 uh, Legislative Program. Uh, this will be briefer. Uh, staff <laughs> requested the board to provide input on that uh, draft, and based on that input, one change was made to the draft. It now includes um, a strategy to work with the maritime community to increase uh, the capacity availability on the shipyard services. And you can find that at the attachment eight right uh, So now that the board has reviewed and input has been into the draft, uh, staff is seeking approval for this final version of the 2023 legislative program. And uh, I don't have any questions to have. Uh, questions that yeah, I'll comment that it's a pretty extensive, you know, I went through it and there's a lot there. There's a lot to, there's a number of important asks in it and there's a lot to track uh, and, you know, to be wary of. And uh, <laughs> you know, we have a budget deficit in the state for the first time. So the state isn't necessarily going to behave the same way. And as Seamus pointed out, you know, that we're 
we're kind of having, we're going to have to really build a strong coalition in order to avoid the fiscal cliff. I think we're going to do that. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll have some success, but they're going to demand a lot of us collectively in trying to do that. And then federally, it's a you know, brave new world in Washington. And, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, what exactly we can expect. I guess we don't know yet from that, but, uh, you know, getting things done in Congress that are new and different. Getting funding through the normal channels might not be too different, maybe not, but getting, getting, uh, getting new ideas into action to be challenged. Um, and that's right. Well, Lauren and um, team that they were critical to the cold water uh, advocates and then representatives of the Secretary of State of What can you secure that funding? In, in the packet, you refer to uh, Ms. Pelosi as Speaker Pelosi, which she is no longer. So, you know, it's fun to call her Speaker Pelosi, but we should probably change the vernacular, I guess, in some way. Former Speaker Pelosi or former. Representative Pelosi or whatever we're going to speak whatever we plan to do uh, on that. Uh, you know, one, one thing occurred to me, and I, I, you know, it's not on the, it would have to be on the agenda for discussion, but. Uh, when I when I I was reappointed to this position a few months ago, and I met with members, the staff from the Senate who were responsible for, you know, recommending my uh, you know, my the appointment, and most of the questions that I received were about emergency response. Uh, so I found myself six, seven tenths of it was about that, and it's because of our name. And so people don't know much. They see a lot of these appointments. Everyone who asked questions was really good. They were well studied. Uh, they had suggestions. I, I was very impressed, very impressed by the. Uh, some people quoted me from what I said when I was first appointed and asked me how that went and uh, <laughs> what we accomplished and all of that. So it was it was That's really awesome. good. But it made me wonder, and I think I might have been asked, you know, should should we keep emergency in the name? If you if you take a look at our own material. We kind of bury WIDA, you know, we have SF Bay Ferry, and then we say a service of WIDA, but we don't have that many other services, you know, so it's kind of who we really are. So, you know, I, I think it might be, you know, as a legislative matter, we might want to consider uh, that it didn't work. You know, it, it has nothing to do with our emergency response responsibilities, but I, I do think it's misleading. And it's hard, it's hard, you find yourself explaining, you know, when you really shouldn't be, you know, at least that's my experience. So, you know, perhaps we could, uh, you know, I don't know what folks think about it and it's not on the agenda, but this is, this would be a suggestion of mine is to consider a bill to change the name. You know, maybe, maybe folks will go along with that. Anybody else have any? Yeah. Well, I would love to discuss that in further detail before anything. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a future agenda item would be great. To yeah. So let's, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it's a big, it's a huge question. Yeah. I wouldn't expect anyone would just want to. I didn't even know if I feel that way. Yeah. So I'd like to discuss it myself. Uh, other <laughs> questions, comments on the legislative uh, yeah. program. Let's let's have a it was, conversation yeah. on yeah. that one. <laughs> It was kind of my idea to do the E years ago. It was brilliant. It was. Yeah, but I don't know. So if it was a mistake, it was mine. No, 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 mm -hmm. not at all. Um, who, uh, <laughs> other other comments, questions on the legislative program? I think I thought it looked good. I, I'm confident that you'll get everything we want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, oh. I would just call out, I really appreciated um, uh, all the references and, and and more probably less on the references and more on the activity for collaboration with like agencies. I, I think that's very critical, especially in these times of need. So thank thank you for being really focused on that and the and that's an added layer of work, but I really think it's important. I appreciate it. So, so the, the our department's focus is um, is that collaboration and that continue. Uh, it's actually one of our goals to continue to make sure all of our partners and everyone that we can uh, work collectively to get this funding and, and the measures to that we can keep up with what we're doing and um, and also provide that same assistance to those who are strong. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate that. And hopefully we'll hear some reports back. I'm sure we will. But if you'll include the how the collaboration portion is going, I'd love to stay abreast of that. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for adding that to our statement. Reports monthly. Yeah. Thank you. Karen. Uh, other comments, questions? Anyone wish to speak on item number seven from the public? Anyone wish to comment? Okay, let's close item seven and take a motion. On item seven. Approving the so legislative moved. program. We have motion. Second. And we have second. Uh, please call roll. Here, uh, Yes. Vice Chair Boyer? Yeah. Director Alba? Yes. Director Del Yes. Director Kim? Yes. Cool. Item number eight adopt final WIDA FY 2024 2028 short range transit plan. Good afternoon, board members. Um, we Uh, uh, give you a chance to see you. So, two months ago, um, I, we came to the board with this draft document for the short range transit plan. Uh, this presentation can be brief. It's just going to cover a summary of the changes that were made in the document and updates on what the board wants to So, uh, the outreach has happened since the November meeting. We opened up a 30 day public comment period. Um, and since then, we've received one comment from MTC. Uh, no significant public comment came in through any of our social media channels or the email. Um, the board comment that we did receive in November was to take a look at what scenarios would look like. Um, with returning to the pandemic fares. Um, so just as a reminder, these are the four planning scenarios that we can look at as part of the short range transit plan. We can get fare box recovery revenue either at 100%, 50%, or 85%, and then looking at different non fare box revenue. So, uh, and then scenario four, as you, as you know, is going to be no RMC. So here's a summary of the um, numbers that we got when we looked at increasing barriers to access to pandemic rates. It would result in a ridership change of about negative 8.4 percent. Fair roughly increased about 17.3. So this is based off of the assumption that riders on our system are fairly competitive to price increases, which is consistent with transit across the United States. Um, and it also uh, retains the assumption that ridership growth rates would continue on the trajectory that we currently are experiencing right now, which um, are pretty generous. So, given all of that, with the increase in fare revenue for the planning horizon out to FY28, the agency will still experience a very significant um, deficit starting in fiscal year 25 if R3 goes to one line by the So we look at potentially a 33% service cut, um, even with these fares. Um, so from the November document, so the, um, this uh, analysis that we did, there's no real significant changes in the outlook of the planning horizon. The agency is still going to face a significant deficit starting in 25, about R3. Um, and increasing fare revenue is going to temper that a little bit, but it's not going to be kind of a silver bullet to um, replace all the R3 costs. So, likely the agency would have to pair a fair rate or a fair increase with other kind of soft measures or revenue. That's my update. So when I forgot to mention, we're seeking approval for the final Thank you. Uh, que Thanks very much. Um, questions or comments from uh, members of the board? 
as as I recall, I may not recall it right. It was said that none of these four were accurate, and that there was actually a different another scenario that probably better predicted what is likely to happen. Does that sound familiar? Uh, so yes and no. So these the first three scenarios in the document were mandated by the Constitution Revolution. Um, so they're kind of rigid in that sense. Um, where Vita falls is somewhere between scenario one and three. So not as optimistic as scenario one, which is 100 percent the pandemic right of Christmas and we don't care about the revenues coming back. Um, scenario three is 85 percent. So somewhere in there. Somewhere in between one. Okay. Um, I had a question on uh, attachment A for the scenario one planning horizon fiscal year 24. Looking at all the variables, they all remain the same, but the operating budget actually goes down by close to $800,000. And I was just trying to understand why that would go down if it's next year, year after. And everything else remains the same. Why would the operating budget go down? <laughs> I'm guessing it's fuel. My so my kind of yeah, it's it's gotta be fuel. Fuel is going down. No, but I mean I agree with you. We need to go check. But, um, sorry. In so in terms of the operating budget, the uh, operating hours, service hours, those are kind of the metrics that we use to track the total amount of service that we're providing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, it's fairly simple. Yeah, I mean, so vehicle hours, vehicle miles, number of routes operated, total route miles all stay the same, ridership doubles. And the operating budget goes down by almost a million. So I was trying to. Understand. Okay. Oh, is it between the four? Correct. That, yes. Is that the difference between the okay. Okay. project? So we have a, a hydrogen <laughs> vessel yeah. that we are planning uh, that, still yeah. to uh, to pilot for six months, okay. and there's a, about a little over million dollar cost associated with that. We have some sponsorship revenue that we'll, we'll, we'll balance that out. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. 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 That's a good question. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? I, I think I'd just make a comment on the fairs again. I mean, when you're looking at a 33% cut, if we don't get on three, I, I don't see like, I'm completely against like raising fares at this point. I'm like, that would be my thing. And then, then the other comment that I make along with it, which I preach every time is when we do look at raising fares, I feel like there's, you know, a, 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 a Speak up segment, a years. segment of the society that, you know, we, we shouldn't be raising fares on that we should be looking at different options for, you know, mm -hmm. people that are riding our, our ferries that are coming out of some of the places that we're serving, such as Richmond and Vallejo. And, um, and I say it every time, and, you know, I, I, and I'm not, I understand that we're looking at an overall fare increase when we talk about it, but I've said it for several years that I don't believe that um, when it comes to fares, that one number fits all in, in the Bay Area, especially when we're looking at, you know, getting ridership um, and having people use the ferry that haven't traditionally used the ferry before. Um, so I'm just, I'm broken record. I'm just repeating exactly what I'd like to see from staff sometimes is also looking at, you know, different something. options. So, and I know Clipper did a little bit of that but as the ferry service that has been traditionally high in its rates. And it's left a segment of the Bay Area out and been able to ride it. We've been, um, you know, pushed to, to use buses in part. I want the ferry to be accessible to everybody. So that that those are my comments. So the, the next item we're going to talk a little bit about the bears. Yeah. And then you know, we'll be having this conversation. Is there any reason, uh, Seamus, that 
you know, given what Jeff said, that we shouldn't, if other folks feel that way, that we shouldn't adopt the short range plan. This doesn't obligate us to make any decisions on fares or service. It's a, it's something we need to do. Yeah. Right? So part, they continue, they Thank you. Funding. Thanks. Other uh, members of the board comments, questions? Me members of the public on item eight? No one has signed up. Anyone wish to uh, comment at this time? Okay, if not, let's uh, take a motion on item number eight, please. I'll move. Go ahead, Director Moore. Second. Director Do. We have a, a motion and a second on eight. Thank you. Wonderman? Yes. Vice Chair Moyer. Yes. Director Alba. Yes. Director Del Bono. Yes. And Director Duke. Yes. Item nine. Okay. Let's move on to item number nine, fiscal year 2024 fair program. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike already been planning and development. Um, I mentioned Director Del Bono not knowing just the title of the So um for this an information class that we actually we really want to uh, a discussion on the fair strategy for the year going forward. So, maybe think of January, maybe a little bit of talk about what we're going to do fairs in July, but it's actually not. Um, there's a, a you know, for our historical outreach process that's taken um, typically two to three months, and then there are also some technical things uh, with the fair person, fair fee system. They typically require 69 days to software changes. So with those two factors on top of um, ensuring that you have an opportunity to give us the direction you want uh, to uh, draft this program and your vision um, for coming to you in January. Um, so uh, I think most of you are very familiar with the background of uh, where we're at uh, today. Um, the, fair, the FAIR program that we have in place is really the product of our 2022 uh, this year, pandemic recovery program. Uh, that's a limited term program that was approved in fiscal year 2022 and extended into the current fiscal year uh, that serves as kind of our de facto fair policy fair program. Uh, by and large, uh, it resulted in the lowering of the EBITDA wide, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, to effectively match the similar bus and rail that we, uh, that we operate. Uh, in addition to that, um, it was the comprehensive redesign of our service that came seven. Um, kind of walk through and look at that. Uh, a, the part of the design of the program and the limited and the basis for approving that limited term basis is to give us an opportunity to test these changes uh, to see what kind of impact they had and ultimately inform uh, potentially a, a longer term decision to hold the program for them. Um, so that's, um, I think, important background and uh, part of the spirit that we come to you uh, in today. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, some of this again is, is probably repeating some things that have uh, been mentioned today, but I think it's important to know. Uh, you know, in general, I think this program has been successful in achieving the goals that we set out to achieve. And if you remember, uh, before we approved the program, we brought forward a list of, I think, 13 uh, core principles uh, that we sought to achieve with the program. Uh, to highlight a few areas uh, ridership recovery. While we haven't um, recovered the 2019 ridership yet, um, you know, I think an important distinction was made between things that are internal um, to our control and things that are external to our control. And you know, I think a really important lens to view ridership recovery through how we've done relative to the other operators that provide regional transit service in the area. And this is an area that since the onset of the program, um, we've performed consistently well. And, um, as of last month that we have data, um, our rate of recovery was at 61% of our 2019 ridership, uh, our 41% helping 28%. And again, uh, that's not just the one month, that's a pattern that persisted over the course of the program. Uh, another area of uh, success, maybe not as clear success, is promoting diversity uh, amongst the leaders. Um, by and large, across the board, we haven't seen a really significant kind of country in the face shift. Uh, in terms of the income distribution of our ridership, but we are seeing some evidence of success. And in particular, uh, if you look at our weekend demographic information, um, we're seeing that the weekend ridership has advanced um, furthest along in terms of the recovery. Um, we are beginning to attract a, a higher proportion of lower income riders, um, which I think is very consistent with uh, the goal of the program. Uh, beyond that, 
Uh, Kevin and Tom mentioned earlier, 40% of our new uh, riders are new. And uh, the number of riders uh, as of our last survey that have said affordability as a reason, reason for riding the via services have doubled uh, from single digits to, I believe, um, 18%. 18% of riders now cite affordability as a reason to take the So, another metric that uh, while the overall numbers haven't shifted considerably, we're seeing signs that the program is having success. Uh, a third area of impact that we haven't talked about today, this has really been an opportunity for Rita to step out and take a leadership role in terms of regional fair integration and a lot of the uh, a lot of the transformations that you know, people want to see transit make, particularly on uh, yeah, uh, beyond our government, the regional level, uh, things that have been talked about in the Blue Ridge Transformation Task Force. Yeah. Um, so this program really, uh, again, showed presented we had an opportunity that it took advantage of. Uh, to do a lot of the things that we've been talking about to integrate our fares, uh, make them similar to what other fares are in bus and rail systems, uh, more transparent for passengers, and to reduce boundaries and barriers between transferring between services. Uh, we were one of the first agencies to um, to offer uh, essentially free transfers from local services, uh, most local services to our system. We've carried that forward as part of the pandemic recovery program. That's actually one of the initiatives for the um, care coordination and integration study that the region is trying to do. Um, so with all those positives, um, again, it's very important to mention uh, that we use the task at a cost. And uh, you know, we were very uh, transparent and I think open eyed about what that cost was. Um, you know, as of uh, for this current fiscal year, uh, the cost of lowering those fares 20 to 40 percent. Uh, from the pre-pandemic level, it's not into about, about a million dollars in estimated additional subsidies required to operate the system. So that's uh, an additional million dollars of subsidy on the on a budget that's somewhere between 50 and 60 million a year. Um, so Is that, does that assume that uh, fares are that they're completely inelastic, or did you make some allowance for you know passengers we kept or attracted who wouldn't have stayed with a higher fare? Yeah, we we um, you know, but periodically we do a kind of a survey of the literature. Gabe actually did a thread with thesis on um, transit price fair elasticity. Um, so we leverage that. Um, so we use kind of the best practice to assume uh, sort of elasticity uh, pricing. Um, so uh, you know, I I think in sum, uh, we've achieved a lot of what we wanted to achieve with the pandemic. Recovery program, even though we're not back to where we were in 2019, um, you know, which was kind of what we were all hoping for. But again, I think there are some internal headwinds um, that are outside of our control that are really kind of limiting our progress in that regard. Um, so that kind of um, brings us to today. Uh, and, you know, that going back to that decision about, you know, how do we use the information and experience we've had in the pandemic recovery? to inform the we go uh, uh, long-term uh, long strategy, particularly with fares. Um, as the memo kind of sets up, um, there are two kind of potential options, um, broad options that we can pursue. Uh, the first option would be a return to what we did. Um, so this would be a return to uh, a fare program based on the 2011 um, which in effect calls for basically a premium fare to use the fare to a fare. Uh, higher than the similar fares to bus and rail service orders we operate, um, with the likely effect of probably driving some riders away, um, probably probably limiting the rate of growth for our ridership in future years, but um, based on historical experience, probably an increase in the amount of fare box recovery, so the amount of our operating costs that we um, capture through fare revenue. Um, in, in all likelihood, um, while we would require less operating subsidy if we had higher fares, uh, it's not going to fundamentally alter the fact that we have a structural financial situation. Um, with the kind of the fiscal. Um, it may mitigate it, but it doesn't go away. Um, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, the second option would be to, in one way or another, either on a temporary basis through extending the pandemic recovery program or uh, through a long term action to make the fares that we have as part of the pandemic recovery permanent uh, to preserve those fares, um, to take the fares that uh, we've had over the last years, uh, last two years, uh, continue them 
um, not necessarily black and perfect beauty, but isolate them in a way that's consistent with the spirit of the program. With our offering fairs that are competitive and equitable for passengers who have various options to ride, um, you know, that may have otherwise uh, been discouraged from using the ferry um, their bus rail. Um, the effect of this is pretty much the opposite of going back to the, uh, the pre pandemic fairs. Uh, we probably, as opposed to having fewer riders, we'll probably continue to have more riders. Um, future rates of ridership growth will probably be higher uh, rather than lower. Um, but we need to acknowledge that um, we probably will not have as high of a fare box recovery ratio if we were then if we were to go back to the pre pandemic fairs. Um, so the effect of this. Uh, again, um, we have a fiscal cliff situation. Um, it's not going, it's certainly not going to go away, uh, but it will somewhat come down to um, that situation. That One last area uh, that we would really like to be back in um, that, you know, if we were to go forward with a long term program in one way or the other, but it would be unfair to or the situation of pandemic recovery fairs or special event fairs. Um, historically, we've had a separate fair policy uh, for special event fairs. Um, the, uh, the current policy calls for those fairs to be set at a level that the, the costs of, the, of providing those services are fully recovered so that the revenue is neutral. Um, going forward, we'd like to have a comprehensive fair policy that addresses both the regular services and the special event services. And so um, one of the one of the kind of discussion points we'd like to put to the board, um, should we continue the path that we're currently on for special event fairs and we convert it into uh, the current fair policy, or should we take potentially a different path um, special event fairs? Two of the alternative options, uh, two of the different directions we could go on special event fairs would be rather than just merely recover uh, the cost of providing the services, um, we price them dynamically and potentially generate a profit and profit the services that um, could be potentially reinvested in the WIDA system and reduce the subsidies of providing the regular services. Um, on the other end uh, of change, um, we could go in an entirely different direction and potentially lower those fares, have them look more similar to the regular fares that we offer for uh, the commuter services and other services that we operate and you know, provide an additional subsidy uh, you know, affairs special. Um, so uh, a lot of decision points. <laughs> um, I'm happy to uh, provide um, some additional information, uh, answer any kind of immediate questions you have. But uh, again, we just wanted to provide an opportunity to hear your thoughts um, so we can take whatever feedback, comments you have, uh, and then face uh, the future items that we bring to you in the coming months. Uh, uh, so with that, I'll pause and uh, turn it over uh, to you for a uh, step. Great. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, you know, raising the question of the agents here, uh, which, and it's thank you for bringing it to the board early so that we could, uh, you know, ha have the opportunity to think about it and, and understand all the implications of it. So, uh, you know, just, just uh, quickly, you know, by background, I always felt heartburn over the notion of the fare box recovery. You know, not that it's a, a bad thing to expect, uh, you know, a certain percentage of recovery, but I felt that the, the ferry system was being unfairly, uh, you know, held accountable for what other systems weren't achieving and that it held us back from expanding our routes because you look at the fare box recovery on a per route basis and the longer the routes get you know the harder it is to hit the number without putting the fares in a place where you know it's really unfair to the people using the service so um you know now we're in the position where looking at the fiscal cliff the agencies that are most impacted are the agencies that were were you know, had a high fare box recovery like us and uh so this is I never thought that this would happen, but this is a symptom of, the, of what I think is the problem. So, you know, I think mass transit is a really important feature of governmental service. It's vital to, uh, you know, to our communities, to this region. We've got a bay, you know, it separates us. 
people have to cross it. Uh, and the ferry system, you know, provides a really great solution to east-west commutes. And I think we've shown the potential for it to address the north-south commute. And, um, and so we've been working in that direction. And I, I would, you know, I would, I think what we did to reduce the fares was in, number one, it was the right thing to do. I think we've shown it mostly was successful in, you know, doing what we hoped it would do. And from a, you know, from a philosophical standpoint, uh, you know, where what we're trying to do is, you know, you think about the goal, the goal is get people out of their vehicles and using alternate forms to get where they need to go. And um, we're in this situation because people found another way to do that, which was to work virtually, but that has other kinds of impacts. So, you know, sticking to the knitting of it, you know, my, my instinct, it would be, you know, not to, you know, we, we, we should maximize ridership. We should be fair to the riders, to which, Jeff said earlier, you know, we, we should, you know, we have an equity of responsibility. Pricing ourselves away from what people can afford is bad policy. And I think that where the attack has to come is on this notion of, you know, charging a public, a public agency with an undue amount of responsibility for raising revenue that's really out of line with the, you know, it's not in sync with the public interest. So that's a, that's a lot to attack. We're not alone in this, but, uh, and, and we realize there's not an endless supply of funding. You know, just, we don't bring it in at the fare box. It's got to come from, you know, it's got to come up out of somebody else's hide. But I think transit's a high priority of the taxpayers. And I think, you know, we're, you know, we really need to think about, um, you know, this sort of bigger question before we make any kind of move to say, well, we'll get out of this by raising the fares. And you know, we all acknowledge we won't get out of it because the level of the problem is bigger than any fare we could hope to, you know, that we could hope to raise. So I know a lot of transit planners might not agree with that. I'm sure a lot of uh, you know, you know, people who have responsibility for uh, you know fiscal responsibility probably disagree, but I think, you know, we should stand for our passengers and, uh, you know, what we're doing is, uh, is valuable to society. And, you know, it seems to me the last thing we should do is, is, is go back to where we were, which I always thought was just too high. And, you know, maybe we should allow the fares to rise with inflation, that kind of thing. You know, I think, mo you know, modest increases, uh, but I, you know, I would almost say, let's end the pandemic recovery program and keep the fares where they are. And don't call it pandemic recovery. That's what the fares are. And in order to do that, we have to sort through some other things. But that's that's anyway. That's my that's kind of my view of it. As, as far as the special events, kind of open minded on that one. You know, if we, I guess a question would be if we start charging. A premium for that. What about you know? Do we subject ourselves to competition? You know, because you know, once we can make money on it, then the, then the service is open to you know, blue and gold fleet, right? Which has its own set of boats to do more or less the same thing. And wouldn't they want it? They would have sort of have the right to compete with us. So, at a certain price point. You know, we might price ourselves out of the out of the business, but I'm not against us, as you said, making a little bit and you know, trying to get back into you know to feed feed the greater service. Anyway, that's don't know if we thought think about that. Just one point on the special events, we do charge a premium for our special events. Oh, okay. I thought it was just neutral in recovery. No, it's a, you. You need to reserve a seat. And uh, and you can charge a different ticket price. But is, but is it you know is the ticket price greater than the cost of providing the service? No, it's it's targeted towards recovering costs. But we see those uh, trips sell out uh, right. on a regular basis. And so I think the theory here is that if there is a market that um, can be um, uh, tapped into uh, in a way that's revenue positive for us without 
compromising issues like equity uh, and not pricing people out who are normal customers of that service, special events might be the place to look. Okay, I'll I'll leave it at that. For but let me turn over to the board. Others who would like to comment? Yes, you know, I, I yes. would agree with. It's once we get back in, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm going to wait. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with um, Chair Wunderman here. I think we've shown tremendous progress in new ridership, new riders. Um, with the pandemic program and I would support making it permanent, understanding that there will be uh, a revenue loss that needs to be a gap that we need to fill somehow. Um, I do think based on what we just talked about here with the events, I, I would also support uh, dynamic fairs for our um, events. Uh, it doesn't have to be gouging in any way, but um, uh, to the point where it makes sense and also looking at whether it makes sense to add service if we're selling out. Um, we see, as the data is showing from the SRTP, that um, we're assuming that riders are fairly insensitive to price increases where from, if I'm reading this correctly, uh, if we were to go back to pre-pandemic fares, 20 to 40% higher rates would result in an 8.5% reduction in ridership. Uh, um, so it's modest. But we all have also new riders who do use our services because it's affordable. And the risk of losing them and further uh, um, are making it harder for a lower income population or a more diverse population to ride. Um, I think that outweighs the, the notion of our service or our fares being inelastic. So again, I would support um, making the pre-pandemic fares, or sorry, the pandemic fares <laughs> fair program permanent. I would also support um, moving towards a slightly more dynamic event pricing program. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, thank you uh, Chair. I echo uh, the comments already made about um, making the pandemic fair structure permanent. Um, however, I wouldn't want to keep it static. Like, obviously, we need to keep monitoring uh, over time inflation and, yep. you know, just making sure that we're not uh, uh, undercutting ourselves. And um, and then uh, on the special events, so like Vallejo used to have a monthly pass option. And I'm just thinking from an equity perspective, if we allowed uh, reinstituted monthly pass options and had that be similar to the cost of, you know, five days a week, um, every week of a month, have it be close to that price. And then if they could use that same pass to reserve a seat for a special event, then they would not like, you know, for our lower income folks, they would not um, have to pay a premium. They'd be paying for the whole month. I just wanted to throw that idea out there. But, you know, otherwise um, I agree with the premium being charged for the special events. But, you know, if we're gonna keep talking about equity, I wanna make sure we're talking about equity and all things like we want low-income earners to also be able to enjoy, you know, recreation as well and those kinds of services. And, and I'm just curious, like, um, I don't know, you know, it's my first meeting, so I'm not really sure how much research and data we've done on low-income workers. Like, where do they live versus where do they work? What hours are they working that they would need to use a ferry? Or how could we encourage them to use the ferry? Um, you know, some low-income workers have, you know, have to bring trucks because they have tools and all these kinds of things. So, you know, they would never become very work, you know, writers, but just trying to understand all of that. And I don't know if perhaps um, there's any planning grant money available through through the federal inter infrastructure bill for transportation infrastructure. Um, but I know that the infrastructure bill is very targeted for equity. So if we're looking at that, um, and certainly I would love to see something 
um, research or data looked into in regards to like Bait Route 37 is a huge traffic problem. Um, people are spending four hours a day on that, you know, that uh, state route highway. And, and there's no other alternative, like there's no train, there's no ferry, there's no anything like that. That's they're locked into that if they have to do that commute. And so, um, and, and that tends to be a lot of residents coming from Solano County, which as a whole, the average income, the median income for those residents is significantly lower than the rest of the Bay Area. So, <laughs> with that, which is, yeah, no, I got you too, it's all good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that it's really important if we continue to talk about equity that really understand how that equity plays out in our Bay Area um, and how we could, you know, help support that. This is so fun, right? Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm waiting my turn because I spoke out of turn. So I have All right, I will go next. Jeff wants quick to go quick question on that. Did yeah. at the time we put in the, the new stairs, did we look at the uh, that question of where folks live and how to attract them or? We, we, we are sort of constantly looking at that, but we did uh, with yeah. the pandemic recovery program and uh, Tom's group has a uh, community outreach, a community new community outreach focus that's been functioning since the pandemic re recovery program went into effect. It's specifically trying to reach out to uh, low income folks in the communities that we serve and make sure that they're aware uh, of what we've done to make the ferry more accessible. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add a very good comment. That, you know, I think it's really important to always uh, remind ourselves and people that follow our agency, you know, our strategy for equity is to make the system more affordable. It's really one of the most important things. But like Shane mentioned, the Tom's group is going to help. In reaching out to the yeah. um, the helping to research and research about how to process. And we're you know, always uh, trolling for any kind of idea um, to get the fighters out. So, and then um, is that outreach being done in multiple languages? Um, it is, yeah. And so I'll, I'll provide the updates and the but, uh, Tom, you're not being captured by the. You're not being captured by the speaker. The owl's not following you. Yeah, so we're doing English, Spanish, and Chinese. Okay. All the communities we serve. Uh, Brain Gun Outreach helped us in Vallejo and prior facilities. We're getting our new um, contractors on board that uh, the board authorized uh, last month. To, to go into contract with for the next several years. We're, we actually have a document scheduled next week on a ferry so that our community outreach folks can see what they're pitching to, to folks in the communities as not just an option for work. Obviously, on the layout route, we have a lot of construction workers that 5.30 route, everyone's got their lunchbox and their toolbox um, going in for the day in the mail. Uh, we'll probably see them walk by pretty soon to get on the 2.35 back home. Um, but definitely, I think schedule is a big piece of that. That's something we looked at during the pandemic when we were running really minimal service. Did uh, Kevin's group did good outreach to the hospitals? Find out, you know, what 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 are our schedules going to be to help persons get to and from the office if they're willing to take them this time? Um, and we talked about doing an additional schedule survey, really reach out to our current passengers as to what times work for you and what times don't, but then extending that to non passengers, non riders. Uh, as part of our market research to find out what would work for folks in these different sectors. And we really want to make it bi directional. So, Malaya is a huge kind of facility, obviously, over in the as well. You know, there are folks who are living on the peninsula or in the city that go that direction that may not be high earners that still need uh, good transit. And our transit service has not been oriented to those folks. So, making sure that we're offering a service uh, sources. Uh, to, to ensure that we're covering all of our would be great in Vallejo also because we have a large percentage of our population that, that speaks Tagalog as their first language. So okay, Director Moyer. So I'm gonna confess that I don't know what a permanent fare is. Um, I don't know what a permanent fare is. So I, I think what we're talking about might be abandoning the concept that we would go back to the 2019 fair structure. 
I'm I'm in favor of a 2023 2024 fare structure, whatever that is. But I I'm not in favor of a per minute fare. I I think no. that that um I'm 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 bearish on 2023. I think we are in for a wild ride. We don't know anything. Whatever we do in 2022 has no bearing. The the fantastic charts you showed us stopped in September, so we haven't even seen Q4 of 2022 yet. Um, I'm today. I'm I'm going to be interested when you come back with the the data or the at the actual uh, action item. We might know more. I, I, today I'm really uncomfortable, so I'm not in favor of, of the 2019 rates. I think we we the the ROI of going back to those is, isn't there for your analysis that you have showed us. But um, I think uh, we, we have to be extremely uh, agile and and find that balance with our fiduciary responsibility and and with our the goals that we set because those goals that we set in 2020 early 2021 whenever that was are are still the goals as far as I'm concerned um with with respect to the special events yeah you know uh, twofold one is I, I do talk to people who are frustrated that they can't they can't partake in the, in the transit because it is sold out. It's sold out really fast. Um, I'm not in favor of charging more for it, but if there's any way to add more service, um, even, even with some of our partners, I, I think back to what member Delbono said earlier about trying to get people out of their cars, the demand is there. Uh, and I'd love to see some way to capitalize on that. I think particularly as we're servicing, um, you know, the Chase Center, a lot of that has to do with how well the workers have been doing. And I don't think we can plan our, our fair structure around that, <laughs> uh, but maybe we can be agile enough to capitalize on it um, as long as it lasts. So that's kind of my opinion. It, it's, it's too bad. Um, it's really too bad that we don't have uh, more infrastructure in Mission Bay because that for San Francisco is where, where the, the um, traffic is really crazy bad. And you know where where people really are during the day, but but I do see. Uh, I'll tell you with tech, um, uh, those folks that are coming in are still coming in in that midday range. They come in ten nine ten o'clock and they leave by three o'clock. So I'm really glad we're doing that. Yeah, that intermediate. If 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 any of our um, corporate colleagues are able to get get groups of employees back during the day the way they want to, um, maybe there's a way to pick out a couple of corporations, maybe through Bay Area Council or otherwise, and partner with them uh, to bring select groups back as they're doing their team building or whatever they're doing, but I think it's too soon to tell. So is it okay if I, um, would it be possible to extend the pandemic recovery program for another year and then next January through spring decide on a permanent replacement for the 2011 program? Well, um, certainly, certainly, it's a, a force for the, the permanent program, absolutely. Um, maybe I can uh, just clarify what the permanent fair means. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be that the fair is permanent. What we would do is take the underlying principles of okay. fairs and we would devise um, specifically the fair policy. Um, so rather yeah. than have the present fair policy, which has these like uh, counter balance goals of maximizing rider treatment, ensuring um, basically high fair box recovery, we would take uh we, we would revise that policy to support um the fares that we currently have. Not necessarily the exact fare that we have, but the the types of fares that we have. And so that policy, um, you know, we, we certainly are all cognizant of the uncertainty and Cliff, that's that's looking um, the uncertainty with R and three, um, you know, and um, you know, doing change in uh, demand, so that policy can have provisions that allow for um, additional um, You know, something doesn't go as planned, and we were to set forth uh, uh, principles that you know, define the present formula for the fair for the next three or four years. Um, when that's planned, great. We've got the all defined. We've messaged that to our passengers. We're transparent in that regard. 
that for some reason uh, they didn't materialize or play the way we thought they would on that policy that allows them. Just one piece of clarification in the history. So in the early 2000s, a lot of transit agencies, just in those days, but a lot of transit agencies had fares that they would increase every year. The board would have to make a decision every year. And there was a movement at that time that many boards just were reluctant to do that. And many transit agencies found themselves behind in terms of keeping up with costs because boards were so sensitive to it. So there was a movement started, it started with BART and it just cascaded throughout the Bay Area of a five-year fare program that had automatic increases, generally based on inflation. And the idea was the boards always had the discretion to opt out of that. But if they didn't opt out of it, it was basically a, a set predictable. And so Lita joined that club 2014, 2014, 2012. And then, so we were ready to renew that. Okay, thank so you. that's that's the that's the that context here when we talk about we're we're guilty of being too inside baseball that's in the current. Uh, but that's that's the that's the issue. I think yeah. And it, and I'll just also say that the requirements of outreach in doing a fair program is are, are you know to be honest significant. Of course, it's time to step So so for us to do it every year. It's fine. We can do. It. We we certainly have great staff to accomplish it. It's just something that we would have to do. Sort of subject to passengers every year. Mm -hmm. Hey, we subject to do this. That's why that five year structure you need to be on both sides. Well, thank you. So so then just to thank you. That helps a lot. So so just to kind of finish my my perspective then. Um, so if you look back in history, that was now in the middle of the largest economic expansion ever. And so that makes sense. Um, I don't think we've seen the trough. And I and I, I, I know like, you know, we revisit our annual investment policy. We revisit our insurance policies. We revisit a lot of our policies. I'm, I'm, I would like to propose that we revisit our fair policy annually for a while until, until we have better insights. I, I think we owe that to our constituencies. We have, fiduciary responsibilities to, to balance with our objectives and our objectives are, are uh, very significant and very important. We gotta, we gotta make sure that we're keeping up with those. I, I really don't know where, where this is gonna land. And I think you do a great job of doing that with us informally, but, but I think it's, be beneficial to our constituency base to know that there's a formal look every January or whatever it is until, you know, maybe till 2025, I, I really don't know. Maybe till 2024, doubt it, but. The RM3 decision is could, a huge could be the variable. Part. Yeah, one way or the other. Go ahead, direct, Thank, thanks, Marty. So now I'll play the old guy one more point um, because one of the things is RM3. You know, when we when we were negotiating for the legislation on Arm 3, I specifically remember for me, yeah, the money is the one thing, operations, capital, things like that. But the box fare recovery being removed is in that legislation. I mean, I sat yeah. on the phone with Jim Frazier going back and forth with him when, you, you know, and that one of my selling points to him was, you know, box fare recovery might end up getting you service out in Antioch. I mean, at some point, like that's like, that was one of the things. I brought up because that's a huge deal. That's a, that it weighs us down. I mean, so so that's in that in there. And I really really like chaps my hide that you know that we have to be under this waiting for the courts to do it. And all these other agencies don't have box fare recovery, but yet we're still under it because I I almost feel like as board and I know we can't do this, but I'm going to go in my my activist route. I feel like we shouldn't even bother with paying attention to box fare recovery at this point. And if MTC comes to us and says, oh, well, you're, you know, you're not doing your box fair recovery. Well, all these things that Mike pointed out about inclusion and like diversity and like expanding our service and allowing people access to the ferry service that never had it before because the ferry was known as an elite 
trans transportation um, agency, you know, we should point that out to them and go, this is, we were able to get underneath it out of this because we got out of underneath the box fare recovery for during the pandemic. And you want us to go back to, you know, basically you servicing one group of people. Like, I don't, I don't feel that that's right at all. So that's my point. I also don't feel like, you know, and I know this will never happen. I don't think anybody should have to pay anything to take public transportation. That's my view that we're not there yet as a, a country, but one day maybe we will be. So, yeah. So back to the thing, I, I do, I understand the difference, what you were saying about permanent, and I do think we should review the fares on a yearly basis, but I, I, I am all for keeping the fares where they're at now. If I'm not up for raising them at all, I'd be for lowering them, obviously, but I'm not for raising them. So I, I really think that, you know, um, Pippin, like we did a lot of work uh, trying to reach out to labor councils and different groups and like trying to figure out who was using the service. And I do agree with her, like we should research that more in depth of, you know, uh, on that when we do our research of, you know, that that economic group of what, what's preventing them from riding the ferry. Are they comfortable with the rate? Because I think once we became the same price as using the bus and the BART, like we did see our ridership increase. And I I ride the ferry. So noticeably, I saw families on there that probably would have never used the ferry service before. So I think you guys have done a great job at that. I think we should continue to do that. Um, I think we definitely should not not raise the go back to the where the rates are. I think we should adopt what we have now. And then on the special um, the special event thing, I think I'm kind of lined up with what some people are saying, but maybe not totally, and that's okay. I don't think there should be a special uh, service. I, we're talking about getting people off out of their cars onto a boat you know, special rate for profit. I don't like any of that stuff when it comes to, to, to our service. I think that, you know, if anything, we should be adding service. So people that aren't able to get on the boat should be able to get on the boat. That's how I feel about it. I might be the only one sitting here and, and, and saying it at the time that I'm, I'm going to say that those are my beliefs. That's how I feel about it. I think the ferry service and all our services should include everybody and um, from every different class to be able to ride it. And so I think it's a good thing. I'm, I think this is positive that, you know, we were able to test these rates and get out from up underneath those high rates. And that's how I feel. And I, I'm with Monique though. I, I do believe in, you know, we have to be fiscally responsible. I can hear Tony right now going, oh, he's got yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, uh, that, that's where I'm at with it. So that's my, my high horse again. So I thank you for listening. I'll, I'll, yeah. Real question, question to follow that on the special events. I know there have been times when we say, well, we couldn't have another vote because the special event kind of coincides with our service. And so, you know, assuming that there was, you know, for a Giants game where they're going to get to 40,000, you know, there's potential for a lot of a lot of demand. Right. And I don't know how much throughput, you know, through that pier is available. You know, when people come out, you know, how, you know what could we do, assuming that he's got a good point? You shouldn't shouldn't assume, but maybe there's, you have. there's a couple of things. This is probably when you schedule your discussion about the emergency and the day you want to schedule a special events, you know, planning a talk, but a couple of things. The the dock space is limited. Yeah. And affordable part. We share. There's two docks, one for Golden Gate, one we share the Vallejo. I don't think in the Royal East for so if you happen to be going back to Alameda. After a Giants game, we win, we win, not the greatest service. So there's there's a constraint, it's a physical concern. Um, in addition, the Giants moved their game times from 7:15 two seasons ago to 6:45, which caused havoc with us because we're still taking people back from work at that time. At 7:15, it was perfect. We get there and we we had the glory beans pretty well, but at earlier time. Is really kind of constrained us. Um, but in, in either case, there's some solutions that we can explore. I mean, with now with the uh, Air 48, you can yeah. potentially bring Giants fans there. And they could walk across the left field of the bridge as one option. Um, we yeah. can potentially have earlier arrivals, really, really. Um, so there's there's a range of things that if we want to lean into it more. And to be honest with you, Part of the things that you're remembering is in the 2017 to 2019 period, we were so short of vessels. 
mm -hmm. that we, we honestly considered just not doing special event service mm -hmm. because it was stressing our service, our system out so much. Um, it's always been special events have always been viewed as a nice to have but not necessary. Yeah. And so it's just part of all the dynamics. Very helpful. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, yeah the, the special event service is not part of our everyday service. It is a supplement, an add-on, and I think we need to continue treating it as that It and that the additional cost of, of bringing it in. So I, I think it should be treated differently than our everyday, every route service. Um, but I, I I think the pandemic recovery program principles are such a huge improvement compared to what we relied on prior to the pandemic that I, I think they serve really well for the future. Um, having, thinking of it as an annual cycle for a few years makes sense but also thinking about these maybe we it's uh, do we need to refer to them as pandemic recovery or are they just our principles that's the transit fair policy I that's like a that. that's a that's a question um yep just point out that you know, when <clears throat> mayor de blasio announced the new york ferry program you know the major point in it was it was going to be the same price as the subway dome and so you want to use transit, you want to take the bus, you want to take the train, you want to take the ferry, all going to be the same. And, uh, you know, I, I like that. Yep. So. I love that. That's that's a, a perfect segue. I wanted to just make make that point that one of our principles uh, is to keep our fares in the range of other transit systems operating in the same corridor. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we've seen the effectiveness of that with the 40 percent of our ridership not being uh, being new to the ferry system, we know that half of those came from BART and AC Transit and switched to the ferry mm -hmm. because uh, of the changes that we made for, uh, consistent with the pandemic recovery program. And a lot of those folks, whether they're low income or not, they made that change because of the lower fares. Yeah. Uh, it isn't, it's not just low income people who take cost into consideration oh, yeah. when they decide how to travel. Um, but what, that that principle of of keeping our fares matched with the cost of traveling on other systems in the same corridor, uh, if we just keep our pandemic recovery program fares flat as they are right now, and don't anticipate the changes that other systems are making, mm -hmm. uh, because BART is raising their fares, yeah. uh, and AC Transit may be making changes to their to their fare. If we want to be consistent, we may need to propose some incremental changes to ours, or we're going to end up being lower than everybody else. So that's a, a consideration. And there's another angle to that consideration because we talked at the beginning of this meeting about our efforts to seek state operating assistance. And the state is not sold uh, that they should be bailing Bay Area Transit primarily out. And one of the things that they're talking about is if they do set up a program for state operating assistance. Maybe it should be competitive, and maybe one of the one of the guidelines that they should use is asking systems and agencies, "What have you done to make your system more financially stable during the course of pandemic recovery? Have you tried to control costs? If so, how? And have you looked at opportunities for new revenue uh, and right size your system as much as possible without losing riders? And can you tell us how you've done that?" Uh, it might be a, a good point for us to be able to make in, in our advocacy efforts to say that we've been consistent with other transit modes and incrementally increased our fares yeah. uh, uh, recently to be able to extend our runway as much as much as possible. I can see that being mm -hmm. an important topic. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. Okay, that's uh, item number nine. Any other comments, questions from the board? Members of the public would like to speak on item number nine. No one has signed up. No one has signed up. Anyone here in the room or wants to make a late entry into the conversation? Kelly, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. It's been really an interesting discussion today, and I appreciate that you have 
uh, the closed captioning, it's a big help because for some reason, um, the audio isn't always that clear today. Um, I wish I could save the closed captioning, but it's not set up that way. Um, and I hope that you consider that in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I, I think I was going to mention that I think, you know, we, we either need to speak up or we need to have microphones or we need to do something. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure people can't hear us. Sometimes yeah. I can't hear you. And I, I'm, mm -hmm. My yeah. hearing's not that great. But, right. I, and then, I mean, that's kind of the disadvantage of this hybrid. Um, that, oh. it, you know, some, some of you are not very clear. Um, but I'd like to say, Chair, you are you're doing well. Thank you. I'm, I'm boisterous. So uh, we, we, we'll definitely take that other advisement. Thank you. Other uh, comments from the public? Anyone raise your hand or if not, we'll, uh, this is an information item, so we don't need a motion. Let's go to the uh, last item on the agenda, which is uh, business that's not on the agenda. Anyone have uh, anyone from the public wish to raise an issue that's not on the agenda? Kelly, your hand is raised. Is it? Maybe it was from before, I think. Um, if, did you raise it again, Kelly? No, I, I lowered it. Thank you. Just the one, one timer. Okay, that's good. So we will uh, adjourn the meeting at this point. But thanks, everybody. Have a happy, safe, dry, healthy 2023. And a good conversation, good discussion today that paves the way for more uh, to come. Thank you. Thank you.